they're, they're just hired guns, right? And if it's not the cops, then it's it's an organization like the Pinkertons, which are basically mercenaries hired specifically to beat the shit out of striking workers. Uh, there, I, I, There's no, like, flowery fucking academic way of me saying that. That's what they do. They beat the shit out of striking workers. All right. Hello. Hi. How's it going, everybody? It's been a little while since we've done a road reflection video here because uh, it's been it's been a, a crazy start to the year. It's been a good start of the year. I'm not I'm not saying that it's a bad start to year, did the, the year or anything like that. Uh, it's just been a little bit of a hectic start, and I've been focusing more on writing projects than I have on these sort of ranty projects, and uh, which unfortunately, you know, has meant that I uh haven't been able to talk about a lot of current current events stuff um so that's kind of that's kind of the only unfortunate thing that's that's kind of happened over but you know i have a ton of videos and podcasts coming out uh that uh that are going to be available on this channel that i'm that i'm excited to share with you guys and this being one of them um and uh, before we dive in, you know, I'm going to do the the announcements and all that kind of all that kind of stuff pretty quickly here. So if you if you are watching this and you do enjoy content like this, you enjoy uh, talking about bigger issues and kind of taking a little bit of a, a little bit of a deep dive into them or, or ranty videos about news stories or, or about any of these kinds of topics. Uh, please do hit the like button and please do subscribe to this channel and share this out to as many people as you can, especially folks that you think would enjoy a video like this or, or get something get something new uh, out of a video like this um cuz you know a lot of the information i cover isn't available in uh in the mainstream so uh the other way you can help this show is by making a financial contribution uh either as a one time donation or uh as a uh, as a sustaining member by making monthly contributions and the easiest way you can do that is by going to my website which is krishmohanhaha.com it's k r i s h m o h a n h a h a.com slash donate um i try not to put a lot of stuff behind a paywall but uh for sustaining members there are uh, you know, some perks that they get. And, you know, some of them involve unreleased stand-up comedy and storytelling material, uh, bonus videos, you know, behind the scenes kind of stuff. Um, and uh, ba -ba 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 -ba, what else? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about adding uh, a, 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 just a stand-up workshop show that will be primarily for sustaining members as well. So one of the things I do want to mention is if you are a sustaining member and doing a monthly member only stand up comedy show where it's me workshopping a bunch of material or kind of going over some older material that you might have heard, but kind of adding a new spin to it or reworking it in a, in a particular way. Um, but just it'll just kind of be like a fun, loose hangout type of show. It'll be an hour to an hour and a half max if we if we get to an hour and a half. Uh, we might not. We might not get to an hour, you know, and might lead to just a fun time discussion as well. So if you are a sustaining member, um, let me know. Leave a comment uh, or send me an email, direct message me, what have you, whatever your your preferred method of communication is. Because I would love to start doing those, but I want to make sure that, like, folks are going to be there um, because stand-up comedy specifically, specifically doing stand-up comedy is... Uh, it's a group effort between the between the monologist, uh, such as myself, and the audience. Like I need your feedback in order to in order to know. Um, so really, it's a very symbiotic art form, uh, not as lonely as an art form as it's as it's presented to be. Anyway, uh, I have some show dates that I want to tell you guys too. Uh, February third, I will be doing a virtual stand up comedy show, kind of like what I'm what I'm talking about, but I'm gonna, I'm, I'm kind of opening that up to the public. Um, and the sustaining members so that, uh, 
you know, you guys can give me some feedback in person. So if that's a way that you want to give feedback, February 3rd, virtual comedy show. February 17th, that's another Thursday, I will be performing live in front of real people at the Bryant Street Barber Shop, which is where I uh, got my got my cool, cool fucking haircut that you guys see in the video if you're watching the video. Uh, so those are the two dates coming up for February. I'm, I'm, I'll probably end up having a few more um, as as the weeks go on, as you know, uh, cases with Omicron start going down, and so on and so forth. Just want to make sure that it's safe for everybody. Just want, I, you know, the last thing I want is for anybody to get sick um, because they attended a a comedy show. So uh, the last thing is the best and easiest way to keep in touch with all the things that I'm doing, especially get a list of all the videos and podcasts that I've released throughout the week is by signing up for my free email list at krishmohanhaha.substack.com. Uh, sometimes I uh, send out pieces before they're available to the public to the email list. Uh, these like these are like the short stories that I'm starting to write, true stories that I'm starting to write, certain essays. Um, they will be released to the email list first, and then later in the week they'll be released to the general public, as it were. Uh, so sign up to that email list. Uh, I'm also posting less frequently on social media now, um, just because it's better for me. I'm not spending a lot of time you know, being on social media, I'm, I'm engaging a little bit here and there, but not as much as I was last year. Um, that's just better for my mental health. I don't need to be in the cacophony of social media. You know, each social media platform is its own weird fucking thing and has its own kind of subculture within it. And, and I just, uh, you know, I got way too much shit going on. And what I really want to do is focus on creating um, good comedic and educational videos, such as the one that you are currently watching now. Uh, so the best way to kind of keep in touch with what's going on and even communicate with me in some sh way, shape, or form, too, is joining the email list. I'll be a little bit more prompt about responding via emails, and it's and it's also just, you know, I can, I can kind of curate some of that stuff a little bit more, too. So with all that said and done... Uh, let's dive into the topic at hand here. We're going to talk about strike breakers. We're going to talk about scabs. Scabs. I know, it kind of sounds like I'm going to talk about getting cut and forming a scab and the process of how a scab gets formed. Which is like, but I'm, I know I'm weird, but I'm not that weird. Like, we're not going to talk about the intricacies of how a scrape becomes a scab. That's... That, that would be fucking crazy. That would be a crazy video to watch. Uh, but a scab is what you call a strike breaker, right? Um, this is an old term. Uh, it's been around for, for a while. It's been around for as long as striking has been around uh, in, in, in our capitalist economy that we live in here. Uh, strike breakers or scabs are basically workers that cross the picket line. They get hired by companies. They're temporary workers. They get, they cross the picket line so that the company can keep turning a profit, right? So the company can keep making whatever it's making. And in on the surface level, when you kind of hear something like that, you think, wow, well, of course that the company needs to make money, right? Because especially if it's a consumer uh, consumer company, a consumer goods company, uh, if it, you know something like uh, a rice company, a company that like ships rice and grains and things like that, it's a trucking company. They need logistics, right? Uh, supply chain stuff like that. Yeah, you 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 say, wow, uh, these workers are striking, but you know we need to get our cereal, we need to get our bananas, we need to get our X Y Z. So how do we do that? You know, so then the the idea of scabs comes into play. Is these workers get hired? They get hired on a temporary basis. Um, and uh, in a lot of instances, the, the striking workers will try to prevent the, the scabs from getting into the facility. And they do that because uh, you need to show like striking is a huge and very important tool for the working class that shows exactly how important the working class is. Right. That shows why the workers uh, deserve human rights, which is what they're asking for right now. Like, I love the capitalists that make it sound 
like these strikers are asking for the moon itself, but it's like we're not the one that made a dick-shaped rocket to fly around the Earth to get closer to what I'm assuming is fucking the moon, literally trying to have sex with the moon because you're so rich, you've completely lost touch with not just like average people on, on this planet, but the planet itself. But that's what the, that's what the, these these fucking capitalists make it sound like the strikers are asking for. They they make it sound like the strikers are asking for this like enormous piece of the cosmos itself to be delivered upon to them on a on a golden platter. And how dare they? These bootstrap pulling men and women that have earned their billions. How dare these workers? But in reality, you know, these people are not being treated very well. They are working 12 to 18 hours, like in the case of fucking um, uh, Frito-Lay. I forgot the snack company name for a second, but like Frito-Lay, those workers were working 12 to 18 hours, six to seven days a week. They were working almost every day, half their day. And that's illegal, right? But the way that these companies get away with that is by calling them part-time workers, co contracted employees, so they don't have to offer them benefits, and they can make them uh, work overtime without, you know, without having to pay them very well. And they're also in initially like their payment pay is not get, uh, very good either, right? Like we talk about a fifteen dollar an hour minimum wage. Um, and before anybody starts screaming inflation, just remember that inflation has nothing to do with the minimum wage. It has nothing to do with taxing billionaires. It has everything to do with uh, these CEOs and these billionaires realizing that they need to make more money and they, you know, inflate the prices. Uh, the minimum wage has been stagnant for 10 years at 725. The federal minimum wage has been. But inflation still happens. Prices still go up. And that has nothing to do with the minimum wage. Um, realistically, if you increase the minimum wage, pay people more so that they they don't need to lose most of their wages to rent and utilities and have barely enough for food and health insurance and other basic necessities that they that they need. That's not an OK life to live. That's not how you should live your life, right? What did the, what did the socialists ask for? The, the socialists broke the, the day down into three parts. They said eight hours for rest, eight hours for work, eight hours for what you will, right? And the recreational aspect of, of, of things is, is not often considered when it comes to this. So when workers go on strike, they're asking for these basic rights, Um so that's that's what that's what's happening. And usually what happens is that these cops uh, or, or these these scabs are protected by the cops. That's what happens. Uh, the cops will show up. They'll get hired by the company as basically a private security firm. Uh, and and this and the cops will beat the shit out of the strikers. Usually that's what happens. Right. Or 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 the company will hire somebody like the Pinkertons, which are just hired guns. They're mercenaries. Right. And and here. And cops. Little audio issue. Sorry, we'll edit that out. But the cops, the cops get called, and uh, they're primarily there uh, acting as a security force for the rich. They're acting as um, they're they're just hired guns, right? And if it's not the cops, then it's it's an organization like the Pinkertons, which are basically mercenaries hired specifically to beat the shit out of striking workers uh, there I, I there's no like flowery fucking academic way of me saying that that's what they do they beat the shit out of striking workers on behalf of the bosses this is why these mercenaries and and police officers are really not part of the working class i've 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 done various videos um describing this process describing why uh, i talked about the boston police strike of 1919 there's at least two or three videos on my channel specifically talking about that the dollop has also done a great job um, of talking about the boston police strike of 1919 and why you'll never see a police strike and why the police union is really on the side of the bosses the they're working hand in hand with the with the corporate class with the elite class of people uh, and that's historically shown. If you if you study history, if you look into labor history, that's kind of very evident in the way that they treat uh, working class people that go on strike to ask for basic basic human needs, right? Um, 
so so that's and here's the thing like all of this stuff that i'm describing only exists within capitalism right capitalism is a system that creates the need for these jobs it creates the need for scabs it creates the need for for an organization like the pinkertons uh because an organization like the pinkertons in a socialist society where where what we are trying to do under a socialist society or my view of a socialist society would be just to 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 create a better world right to ensure that everybody's lives are taken care of and we're using technology to progress our lives forward and progress the lives of 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 uh, of the planet forward as well so there's an environmentally conscious way of thinking about uh, scientific advancements and progress as well, as well as a humanitarian way. If you're looking at a system like that, you really don't have needs for a mercenary organization and you really don't have needs for um, for scabs to come in and replace workers that are striking right within within a socialist uh, socialist lifestyle, it, you would have something like a worker co-op system that would be used in the workplace where people vote and, and it is a democratic system. And I know people like Dr. Richard Wolf has talked about this a whole lot. Um, and I've talked about worker co-ops in this channel several times as well, but that just allows democracy to actually exist right if you if you have this democratization of the workplace, then everything else, starts getting even more democratized. You have more involvement. You have a more intellectual populace. You have more critical, uh, a, a more of a critical thinking populace because anybody from the working class can move up the ranks, right? They can become the CEO or a board member or so on and so forth, right? Again, this notion that socialism doesn't have any hierarchy in it is total bullshit. It, there is hierarchy. It's just the value of the human is not associated with the hierarchy. It just means that we need somebody to organize and lead certain people. We need somebody to be in that level. But it doesn't mean that they are more or less important than the people doing the job. I've done a lot of group uh, group activities. I've run shows where I've de had to depend on a lot more people. But I am no more important than the person that I need to that that I need to rely on to put out chairs or set up the sound equipment or take tickets at the door. You know, while I'm seating people and kind of managing all of this. You, there's an equivalent level of importance here, but there's still a hierarchical structure. Under capitalism, your worth as a person is determined by that hierarchical structure, right? And 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 because of that, strikes became a necessary tool and a necessary uh, tactic to um, to get human rights to 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 make things a little bit more equal. So. Scabs can exist within a socialist society. They just don't. Mercenary organizations don't exist within a socialist society because it's a different way of thinking. It, 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 effectively, if we do switch from a capitalist society to a socialist-leaning society, which still would have money, which still would have economics at play, another major misnomer about socialism, right? Um, you know, we don't have needs for these things. There, it, it, the, the mentality is far different. This mentality it comes from why capitalism needs unemployment. Like unemployment, it, and, and it's vilified too, right? So it creates this societal shame and it creates this desperation. So even if you look at a company like Nabisco or Kellogg or John Deere or any of the companies uh, where we saw major strikes last year, even if you disagree with those companies and you say the workers are being treated terribly, but you're unemployed and you still need to make money to put food on the table for your family, you've created the scarcity and you've created the conditions necessary for the strike. So the scabs themselves, the strike breakers themselves, it's very difficult to blame them um, as 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 the problem in this situation. The problem all, is going to wind up being the bosses, the owners, the board members, the CEOs, the, the, those, those folks are where the problem originates from. Those folks are creating the need for scabs by creating a society uh, that is that that has all this scarcity, right? And and what does this do? Is it is it is it it discredits some of the strikers 
in saying, well, look, these people are working and they're working for, you know, seven twenty five an hour with no benefits because and and the, again, the corporations can get away with this because they're temporary workers. Right. So they don't need to operate within the same um, parameters that full time employees would. They don't need to give them benefits. Right. They don't need to technically give them overtime pay. Yeah, sure. They're only allowed to work between 30 and 33, 32 hours, something like that. It depends on what, what company you're working for, I think. Uh, when when I when I had a retail job, it was uh, I couldn't go above 32 hours. Um, with if I if I remained uh, over 32 hours for a particular period of time, I was no longer considered part time, and I would have to start getting full time benefits. So they always scheduled me under 32 hours, uh, which you know is is great if I was getting paid a decent wage. Uh, if if everybody's getting paid paid 20 25 bucks an hour, yeah, great 30 30 to 32 dollar or 30 to 32 hours of work within a week is no big deal. It's, you know, cause I'm getting paid a decent amount. I can still get work part time, pay my bills and have a life outside work. And again, that's what it should be, right? You should have a life outside work. That's something that, that, um, that we really need to emphasize in this society. And that is again, another paradigm shift because under capitalism and what these bosses are actually fighting for and what these bosses have always fought for since the early 1900s, since even before that, is a 24-hour work stream. They want constant work for constant profits and constant production. And eventually what happens when you do this constant, constant, constant thing is the need for your product becomes reduced, right? People don't need pants all the time. People don't need to buy a new computer every day. So then that's why that's why the planned obsolescence exists, right? It's all to just keep capitalism moving forward. It needs to invent these things in order to continue existing when in reality, it, it really doesn't fucking need to exist. It's a system uh, because it's extremely predatory. And, and again, I'm, I'm, what I'm describing to you is the crux of the problems within capitalism. But that leads to the next myth, right? The, hiring these strike breakers, hiring these scabs um, emphasizes this myth that rich people create jobs. And not just that, but, you know, and that's fine and dandy. But what we don't talk about in this situation is the quality of the jobs, is the quality of the, 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 the worker uh, worker's life at that job, right? We don't talk about that. We talk about just, oh, well, the jobs are created. whoop dee hurrah, huzzah for everybody. And again, that's nice and that's fine and that's dandy and all, but the quality of the job. How do these workers feel? Do they, are they getting anything out of it? Well, none of that is really discussed, right? Not, all of that's kind of put, put aside and, and uh, it'll be deflected by the media. And, you know, they'll say, well, we're, we're a right to work state. And that's it. That's what that's all capitalists and usually more, more more often than not, the Republicans look at work. It's a right to work. And that's it. But we forget that life is more than just a job. Right. But to the capitalists, that's not what matters. What matters is that you break your back to make them more money. And when when there's a strike, that means that they're not making money and they can. Um, they would just make less money. Because if everybody in the company is going to get a 10% raise, right, or a 20% raise, oh, well, where's the money going to come from? Well, it's going to come from your billions. Frito-Lay made, uh, what was the number? I should have looked up this number before. Uh, but Frito-Lay made like $18 billion during the pandemic alone. And none of the workers that are the ones that got everything onto the trucks and, you know, were responsible for packaging all the, the snacks and all that kind of stuff got to see a dime of it. They, well, maybe they got to see a dime, like literally a dime. Life is more more than just about work. Right. Again, it goes down to the, the way that these socialists in the labor movement in the early 1900s broke it down. Right. It's eight hours for work, eight hours for sleep, eight hours to do what you please. We don't have that in our society, even for someone like myself, 
you know, I I'm I uh, am am lucky enough to have hit this point in my life where I do get to kind of make my own schedule. I do get to work the hours that I want to work. And then and then now I'm I'm at, at that luxury point because I'm not touring as much and my relationship to comedy has changed where I don't need to work and break my back all the time to earn a decent living. Like I'm 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 okay right now. I'm very lucky to do that. And it was a realization that I've had over the last few years. You know, some of the, some of the folks that have probably been paying attention, paid attention to what what I was going through last year. Know that is I, I you know, I wanted I want to have a little bit more of an enriching life. <clears throat> you know, hanging out with with my friends more. You know, getting getting back into drawing a lot more. You know, like getting reacquainted with books that I want to read, comic books that I want to read, video games that I want to play building a better relationship with my friends, building a better romantic relationship with people that I want to build a romantic relationship with. All those things when you're a stand-up comedian on tour in a capitalist society is very, very difficult to do. And then add add my my political and philosophical views on top of that, and it's even harder to be uh, a stand up a touring stand up comedian. You know, it's a lot of work. It's nonstop work, but life is more than just work. You got to put some re a time for recreation in there. You got to put some time for self reflection in there. You got to put some time for physical health needs in there and mental health needs in there. Right. So, recreation is a basic need. And, and I think you can loop the argument that the internet is a basic need because it does provide us some kind of recreation. It, it, it has a lot of potential for that kind of respite. So in that regard, yeah, I would put the internet in as a basic need. And I know there's a lot of arguments. I'm not here to get into any arguments about whether the internet should or shouldn't be a basic need. If you, if you say no, I think you're wrong. Uh, I've put my arguments out there. Um, but I'm not really get, I'm not really here to get into that kind of an argument. Now, here's the thing with scabs, right? Is they they can be detrimental to the bosses because they're unskilled. They don't know how to work the equipment properly. They don't know how to work as a team because they haven't been, right? An organized labor force is very important. Even for capitalism, like you want an organized labor force, man. Like that's what you want. You want efficient workers because you want to maximize profitability, right? Those are terms that you hear capitalists talk about all the time. So hiring scabs, you know, is is I think a show of weakness to 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 show exactly how desperate they've gotten. It's a last ditch measure, but it's kind of a little bit of a double edged sword in that case, especially for for us on the left, because yes. It does mean that the 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 quality of products that these scabs are going to make are not going to be as good as the regular workers, the people that know the ins and outs, know how to be efficient, have a good workflow going. Right? They have that flow state that 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 people talk about when you get in the zone and and you work as kind of a unit, and that's what you want an organized labor force, right? But these folks aren't. But the longer they stay on the job, and so this is how you kind of see. Um, corporations utilizing tactics to extend the strike and then further demonize the strike because then the scabs start getting better at the work. So let's say the strike goes on for a month. Well, on, on day one, the scabs are terrible, but by day 30, they're probably getting their hang of it. So they the, so so the hiring of the scabs just means that the the capitalists are and the bosses are are getting ready to extend that strike to make it longer than it needs to be right so you kind of see these bullshit contract negotiations come up where they know what they're doing is wrong where they they know what they're kind of offering the workers is a bunch of shit right so 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 then what happens is if the workers take the deal they're getting a, a shit deal. That's what happened with the uh, with the Frito Lay folks. Like, I think they said that they got one day off and they can't work past twelve hours, which is still like four hours way too long. You can't have somebody work twelve hours. What happens to their overtime pay? Are they getting a pay bump? They didn't get a pay bump, but they accepted it. They accepted the terms, which sucks. Which you know, the or, or rather, I think the union accepted the term, which sucks. 
but in the case of John Deere, in the case of Kellogg, in the case of Nabisco, they declined several rounds of contract negotiations. And that also works in the favor of a boss or a corporation that has hired scabs. Because then what they get to do is create some competition within the scabs themselves, right? Because they seem temporary, but uh uh-oh, what if they're really good at the job that they're looking at? Remember, these people are these people originally were unemployed or underemployed, right? They're desperate to to make ends meet because we've created a society where the dominant economic force is a scarcity model. So you've created a sense of scarcity. And now you've created this hyper sense of competition. So these people are going to do whatever it takes to keep that job so that they can have a pay. It doesn't have to be good pay because they just need something because we've created a world where people are just desperate. Right? That's kind of where we're at. Now, if it's a hyper-specific job, and this, again, is one of the ways that you can push back against these strike breakers, is, is the more specialized your job is, the harder it's going to be um, for, for, for them to hire strike breakers, right? Because specialized jobs involve more training, more schooling. It, you know, it might involve a very niche thing to do. And there might not be a lot of people that are good at at that specialized kind of thing. So like to me, and this is going to be very difficult, but like if surgeons, for example, decided to go on strike, right? And, and, and this, I think this would be monumental. If surgeons and doctors, these are, these are people that work at hospitals that work in specialized fields, like, you know, uh, these folks went on strike and demanded that we pass a Medicare for all bill and they won't go back to work until we do because, you know, they're not having health care kills more patients than surgeons going on strike. Now, that's tough, right? I, I think I'm, I'm kind of giving you guys the ultimate example. One where the bosses really won't have much of a choice. Right. But but it's but it's also the same reason it's, it's like cops. If cops went on strike, that would be a huge blow. But the cops will never go on strike against the establishment, against the bosses. They'll just never do it. That's what that they that that was determined by the Boston strike of 1919. That was determined by that strike. You know, they they taught cops a lesson so that they specifically wouldn't go on strike in the future. But that's where the power lies. The more high profile and specialized your job is, you kind of hold a lot of power, especially with strikes, because what really strikes do is they show the power of the working class, how important the working class is. And again, it pushes capitalism to admit that you can have hierarchy without the power and judgment that comes with it. Right. Without without positioning people within class structures, within socialism, you can have hierarchy. But you have more purpose driven uh, workforce. Which means that everybody is at a, at an equal level of importance in order to get the job done. But on a managerial level, yes, you do have more responsibility. So that person can get paid more. But we're talking about what the pay gap here is. Right. And this is this is how the scabs perpetuate the pay gap problem. What's what scabs end up doing and then the media kind of facilitates this bullshit narrative. It's this false narrative that, hey, look, these guys are working for these lower pay. So these strikers must be wrong. And it completely ignores the the humanitarian aspect of it. It completely ignores the abuses these people have to take at these jobs nonstop just to earn a living. And that sh- that's not the right thing. You shouldn't be putting your life on the line for very little pay and be, get treated like shit. That's what these people are asking for. So how do you prevent this stuff, right? Because capitalists are going to do it. Uh, we've seen plenty of examples of how radical socialists 
and unions, this is back in the 30s when unions had power and weren't co-opted by corporations and polit and corporate politicians, right? Depowered, defanged, and then bought out to always side with the with the bosses, which is kind which has basically been what's been happening for 30, 40 years. The most effective tactic was in 1934 in Toledo, Ohio, when automotive workers went on strike. And when they went on strike, they were backed by the union, and the leader of the union, the, the, the leaders of the union, uh, were radical socialists. And here's what they did. They fed every single unemployed person and every single person on strike. They, they set up a food kitchen, and that way, uh, it, it took out that scarcity need. It took out that desperation from the unemployed. So now the automotive industry, ooh, whoops, uh, couldn't hire, uh, couldn't hire strike breakers. Because what need did the do the do the strike breakers have when they're already being taken care of by these radical socialists who have now told them and shown them that they're actually fighting for their rights. They're actually fighting for their benefit because they are. That's the most effective way. They got rid of the the scabs, right? And they were all and 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 they and the unemployed then showed solidarity with the striking workers, and they won. That was a huge victory. So what's the takeaway from this, right? Let's spell it out because some sometimes people are not going to get the fucking takeaway from me just telling the story. So let's 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 not not mince words here. You you want to know how to defeat strike breakers? You want to know how to how to defeat these corporate bo bosses and decrease the wealth gap and and improve the lives of the most amount of people? You support strikes and you support mutual aid because when those two things come together, they're they're unstoppable by capitalists. We have enough food in this in this whole world to feed everybody. We have enough money to take care of, clothe and house people. We absolutely do. The Pentagon gets an incredible budget. It's not like we don't have the money to do it. It's very very simple to do this stuff, right? So the takeaway should be that you should fund your local mutual aid. You should find a mutual aid or you should find, uh, you know, maybe a local DSA chapter that is running a mutual aid or running mutual aid programs. You should find these things. They're grassroots. They're usually organized by regular people that are not trying to turn a profit, but rather just feed the community, right? It's people volunteering their time. I have plenty of friends that do this. It's 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 really amazing. Um when people do this, so I don't have the time commitment to go out and do what these people are doing, but I can donate. I can put finances behind it, right? And it doesn't have to be a lot, uh, you know, like it, a couple bucks here and there. We'll do it. Do that. Make a monthly contribution, five, ten bucks a month. That goes a long way. You don't need to support charity industrial complex places, you know, like Susan G. Komen, like these big corporate charities. They're not doing anything to help people. The pandemic proved it. There was a mutual aid revolution in 2020 that was not talked about by corporate media because why would they? But, there, but you know, mutual aids blew up. In fact, so much so that in the beginning of the pandemic, when people just it started giving to mutual aid and started independently making donations to uh, independent artists and restaurant workers and people that were kind of put out by the pandemic, Facebook actually got rid of those posts. They got rid of those links because those links weren't connected to the, chari the corporate charities within Facebook itself. These corporations don't want you to support mutual aid. They don't want you to support these grassroots efforts. They want you to funnel more money through these <laughs> through these corporate charities so that they continue getting bigger tax breaks. But if you really want to, to support strikers, then you need to support mutual aids. And then mutual aids need to work hand in hand with these strikers. And boom, now, now the bosses don't really have a way to combat the strike using strike breakers. 
Now, of course, the other way, of, uh, the other, there are other methods of, of preventing strike breakers too. And, and, the, and we saw that in 1934, right? With the, with the trucker strikes, they pretty much got violent with the cops. The cops attacked it first. Go figure. Uh, I know. Shocking. What? Cops were the ones that threw the first punch. What? Cops, the ones that are instigating violence. Holy shit. Who could have ever thought when you have a whole force of people that serve and protect with a gun, <laughs> you know, but the cops attacked first and the truck, the, the, the people in the trucking union fought back. I mean, a bunch of people died. But they prevented the strike breakers from going in and, and doing their jobs. That was kind of the point. Now, is is that something that I advocate for? No, but it is a part of history. It is a method that has been used to complete the mission, but it is is it the most effective one? No, I think the most more effective one um, is, the, you know, the combination of a mutual aid with striking. Now, the, the Democrats here don't want to show you how strong the labor movement is, right? Even and, and they and that, that's done on purpose because the Democrats are a corporate party. They're co-opted by most of these corporations, right? Like most of these corporations, this is the other thing that people don't realize. Like most of these large corporations give to both parties because they're just hedging their bets. Regardless of who wins an election, the corporations are going to win. Because they gave X amount of dollars to some some fucking politician, and that politician is going to write a law, especially on a local level. They're going to write a law that only benefits Corporation X Y Z. That's that's how the system works, right? So again, if you want to stop that, then you got to stop putting money into politics and putting more money into mutual aids and more money into local grassroots organizations that are doing shit on the ground for the community. You know, like it's nice that people gave twenty seven dollars to Bernie Sanders, but that twenty seven dollars going to a mutual aid, especially at this point in time, is going to be far more valuable. That dollar is going to go a lot farther. That dollar is going to be a lot more useful. It's going to feed a lot more people than giving twenty seven dollars to Bernie Sanders. Your twenty that twenty seven dollar contribution to a mutual aid might have fed six families. But the politicians don't want you to see how powerful the labor movement actually is, right? Uh, I know Biden's not actually tweeting. I'm I'm pretty sure this guy still has like tactile porn, you know. Like we, he hasn't discovered that porn is just free and readily available to you at all times. If I if you if you want to, you could pause this video, get a wank on, and then come back to this thing. No problem. Technology is has made <laughs> life easier in a lot of different ways, but I don't think Biden's the kind of guy. I'm pretty sure that motherfucker probably still has a flip phone. Uh, so I know Biden's not actually fucking tweeting these out, but his administration is. There's a team of people tweeting out propagandistic bullshit from his Twitter. And, and the crazy part is there are people, just like there were people for Trump, that follow his Twitter and kind of take those words as gospel. Right? I know there are Democrats that do this. It's sad. Uh, and I feel very bad for them because it's like, my God, is your entire identity hinging on a political party? Oh no, what's happened? Somebody needs a hug, right? Like you need to feel something real and not some bullshit thing, uh, i.e. political parties. But Biden, he's been tweeting out how great the economy is doing, right? Where, oh my God, the American economy has never been stronger. Oh my God, isn't it? Blah, 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 you know, like, which is bullshit because the American economy is not doing great. We're, the the homeless population is skyrocketing. People are getting evicted. The, the cases are going up. Hospitals are being closed. Beds are being taken away. The ICUs are filling up. We can't take care of a pandemic. We could barely send home test kits out to people. And now it's limited to four per family. Like, what the fuck? You couldn't send out masks to people. You can't make up your mind on whether you should mandate masks or not, whether you should mandate vaccines or not. You're in this weird gray area that perpetuates conspiracy theories even more and, and, and pushes people to not get vaccines and question the government, even though what we should be listening to are public health officials. I mean, the, the whole thing is a clusterfuck, right? But you can't say that the economy is going strong. You just can't. It is going strong in the sense that rich people keep getting richer. If that's what you mean, then yeah. Fucking Jeff Bezos just added $34 billion to his own personal wealth. 
during a time where everybody else is struggling. Yeah, in that regard, great. The economy is doing awesome. But in reality, people are struggling more now than they did in 2019 when Trump was in charge. So, so just give that a thought. But the thing that I uh, I saw, and a good friend of mine, Zach Funk, pointed this out to me, right? Zach sent me this tweet of his. Um, but and, and the tweet basically says that, you know, the, the reason uh, – it's he he basically like says that there there needs to be less regulation that was it sorry it kind of blanked out on what happened there uh but they but he basically said like what what needs to happen is less regulation for infrastructure and bridge construction uh because regulation is the thing that's gotten in the way and that's what's causing the supply chain problems it's not corporations treating their workers like shit. It's not that the working class has gained some self confidence, and would and and we would like to see a a a closure of the wealth gap that's making America into a failed state. No, no, no. It's not that. Ignore all the striking workers. It's regulations. Which, first of all, if there's something that absolutely should be regulated heavily and have rules in place and listen to, like, science and fucking math, it's bridge construction. His statement is literally calling to burn bridges, very literally. And then eventually, metaphorically as well, because you've burned the entire bridge to 350 million people that depend on, you know, fucking bridges. <laughs> It's it's propaganda. It's all that is. All these tweets are just propaganda. And then these people and then these people use these tweets as actual fucking facts. Like get the fuck out of here, man. How sad is your life that a tweet is a fact? Read a book, read an article, read something else other than Twitter. This is why I'm fucking not on social media as much anymore. But that's what but that's what they do, right? And and now and now people don't pay attention to the strikes. They don't pay attention to what's going on with the labor movement. Because they go, yeah, you know what? Maybe we should like have less rules for bridges and more of those things would get cons No, no, no. We need more rules on bridges. Because these cretins are going to half ass it. These cretins are going to I mean Cuomo did that. Cuomo's dad did that. They cause disasters because they would rather turn a buck than actually build a functioning bridge. It's wild. And look, and the only reason why you see propaganda is when they're losing. Propaganda is, is, the, is the tactic of the loser. And that's what these people are. They're imperialist fucking losers. They don't give a shit about what actually matters. So you don't want to support strike breakers. You should be supporting the strikes. Pay attention to the people covering the strikes. Uh, Left Voice, they do a great job of covering strikes. Um, Popular Resistance does a great job of covering strikes. Uh, who else has done? World, World Socialist Website does a great job of covering strikes as well. Uh, there's a lot of places. Radindymedia.com. Just go to radindymedia.com. And and you will see a plethora of independent lefty uh, news outlets, including myself. Uh, and uh, and and you'll and you'll check the you know you'll see news about the labor movement. This 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 resurgence of the labor movement we've seen in the last three years, which is very exciting, by the way. So, uh, yeah, go to radindymedia.com to do that. That's that's a little that's a little plug at the end of that. Uh, cool. I'm going to wrap this thing up. You guys know the deal. Like, share, sub subscribe. Wherever you're watching this, like, share, subscribe. And if you're watching this on YouTube, I do want to let you know that I'm going to be putting out some videos um, doing, you know, movie, music, uh, television, comedy special reviews. I'm going to talk about reviews, re reviewing some pop culture stuff with the sociopolitical and philosophical lens. Um, and I'm going to have to use clips I'm going to have to use visuals from the program itself 
And, you know, I'm going to make it very clear that this is not my property. I'm borrowing it for the sake of making the argument that I'm making for the piece that I'm writing. Um, but all of the ownership and all that goes to the people that originally created the piece, right? Uh, but YouTube won't let me do that. So if you do want to check out those videos and you want to see uncensored content, uh, go to Rockfin. My, uh, my page is rockfin.com slash Haha. Or go to Odyssey. Uh, again, you can find me at Krish Mohanahaha on Odyssey. And those reviews will specifically be posted to those two platforms. Because I can't post them on YouTube or Facebook. They'll they'll kill my account. Uh, so just a heads up. If, if you guys are watching on YouTube, you, you know, do make a Rockfin account. Do make an Od or an Odyssey account. Um, or pay attention to my website. Or, you know, sign up for my email list. That's a free, easy way to make sure you get the links to all this stuff. Um, uh, and you can also make a donation to improve the quality of the content that I am producing. Uh, less less audio glitches, hopefully, <laughs> in the future. Um, but uh, yeah, so there's the the, the there's that. Uh, again, you can go and find all this stuff on my website, krishmohanhaha.com. K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. Uh, and, uh, and that's that. Well, thank you guys for tuning in. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Uh, we'll, I'm going to be putting out a couple more of these in the in the coming week or so, and then we're I'm I'm switching back to kind of working on some larger, um, you know, written pieces. Uh, so so the 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 live ranty stuff might be a little sparse for for a little bit. But thank you guys for tuning in and hanging out with me, and uh, we'll see you in the next one. Bye guys. Oh yeah, the I I, I forgot I, I haven't done these in so long. I forgot my sign off. Uh, but you know, be, be, take care of yourselves and be good to each other and we'll see you on the road.